Hey there, everyone. Today on the final bar, rates down, stocks up. The major benchmarks push higher with the NASDAQ up about 1.7% today. Cryptocurrencies jumping higher as well. Grayscale gets new life in their bid to convert the GBTC into an ETF structure. Also, Danielle Shea of Simpler Trading is going to be joining us from Austin, Texas. What does a short covering rally really look like? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the action in the markets using the power of technical analysis. The technical toolkit really is designed to help us focus on what's actually happening in the markets. For many investors and many uh, market practitioners, it's all about what could happen, what should happen, and it's easy to get caught up into all sorts of different narratives, a lot of times competing narratives. Things that you would uh, assume would push risk assets higher, other things that you might assume push risk assets lower. Technical analysis attempts to cut through all of that noise by focusing on what actually is happening in the markets. How are investors voting and traders voting with their capital? What sort of buy and sell decisions are aggregating up into overall price movements and trends? We're seeing a, quite a bit of a bounce here from the growth trade as uh, last week wrapped and uh, we're now uh, back into things uh, this week. I was off the last couple days in Oregon around Mount Hood and special thanks again to Miss Schneider of Market Gauge for guest hosting the show yesterday. Uh, that is not an easy thing to step into and she did, I thought, magnificently well. Make sure you watch that uh, and also our conversation with uh, Keith Schneider on that show as well. That was on yesterday on the final bar. Today, let's dig into our market recap and see how things played out through the course of the trading day. As I mentioned, sort of a nice risk on feel to the tape today. Before we get there, why not answer a poll question? We asked you recently, which price pattern features higher highs and lower lows? I, I think many times a show say things like higher highs and higher lows, lower highs and lower lows. These are the basic measures of trend that Charles Dow introduced uh, 100 plus years ago. The correct answer, higher highs and lower lows is called a broadening top or a megaphone top. This is actually a not super common pattern, but it does happen uh, occasionally. And I'll show you an example of one that's not quite a broadening top, but kind of gets close to one, so you get an idea of what it might look like. But it basically is where you have an uptrend. This is Johnson & Johnson looking at the last three or four years. You have this nice uptrend, and then look at this period right here, where all of a sudden you see the highs getting higher, but all of a sudden the lows starting to widen out. A true megaphone top would have subsequent highs that are continuing to expand, while the lows are widening out. So this isn't quite it because this high would need to be up here somewhere. But that's kind of what a megaphone top or a broadening top pattern uh, would look like. It is pretty rare because usually at the end of a phase, you get things starting to come in a little bit. You tend to have lower highs, right? You tend to have a, uh, a, a uh, transition of sorts from an uptrend to a downtrend. This is actually an expansion in the range. So instead of a triangle where things are kind of narrowing in, this in, uh, in this case, it's actually widening out. Usually a megaphone topping pattern, if this was one, uh, becomes a uh, pretty clear sell signal when you break below the lower end of that range. What you have to remember is this ends up being a period of pretty excessive volatility. I actually couldn't come up with a great example of a megaphone top. Do you guys know one? Is a one a stock or uh, an ETF that you've been looking at recently feature that mega to megaphone top pattern? Uh, drop a comment below. Let me know. I'd love to see some uh, recent examples of one. I couldn't find one readily available. Let's keep going with our market recap. As I mentioned, kind of a risk, off, uh, risk on feel to the tape today. The S&P narrowly closing right below 4,500. Now, this is a level we've referred to many, many times. We talked about the uh, break above 4,500 and then the subsequent failure to hold that level is a key argument on the risk off scenario that we've been experiencing over the last couple of weeks. Today, the S&P and the NASDAQ pushing back higher. Pretty decent strength, to be honest with you. The S&P up about 1.5% to just below 4,500. The NASDAQ composite remaining just barely below 14,000. That's up 1.7% from yesterday's close. And then mega cap NASDAQ 100 up over 2%, about 2.2%. Mids and smalls all up as well. So everything in sort of the equity space having a pretty decent day. Not everything, but most things. The only red we have on our, uh, on our dashboard here on the front page is the VIX, which is actually coming uh, down quite a bit. So one of the things we talked about or one of those general themes in recent weeks has been the market sort of chopping around, losing some ground with volatility increasing. And that's one of the signs of a pullback phase within a bull market is you have 
a spike in volatility. And as investors start taking profits, as price starts to pull back quite a bit, 50-day moving averages maybe don't hold, which is one of the things we've seen. And you see volatility increase. The way you often exit from this sort of pullback phase is you make a higher low. Uh, we start to get back above the 50-day moving average. Breadth indicators based on that kind of metric start to get a little less negative and volatility tends to subside as people start to accumulate uh, shares once again. So for now, for today, that's kind of the pattern that we've seen. Now, a full recovery would need not just one day. This is a multi-day, multi-week sort of push higher, but certainly it's sort of seeing a nice, uh, a nice move to the upside today. Now, a big part of that story with uh, growth stocks leading the way higher is interest rates coming down. You're seeing the 10-year yield right around 4.12%, long bond yield around 424, the five-year yield very similar around 428. So the fact that uh, interest rates have come off after making a new, uh, a new swing high, particularly the 10-year point, which is a common one we refer to, certainly giving space for those growth stocks to go higher. In general, higher rates, not great for growth. Lower rates, a little better environment uh, for growth stocks because it's all about the future uh, cash flows, right? Free future earnings. And with higher rates, those future earnings are just less attractive today. And so growth stocks tend to be uh, assumed to be worth a little bit less. So today, sort of a risk-on, growthy type of uh, tape with growth stocks up, the NASDAQ leading and interest rates coming back down. The dollar, another thing to watch as well, the dollar actually down 0.6% from, uh, from Monday's close. Looking at the commodity space, a lot of green here to start off with. The DBC, which is a broad commodity ETF, up about 0.4%. Gold and silver actually moving higher as well. The GLD was up 1% today to uh, just below 180. And the silver ETF, SLV, up 2.2%. Might be an area of the markets to watch. Gold has not been a particularly strong asset class recently. Uh, although long-term, certainly testing those upper ends. But it's given back a lot of those uh, recent gains here uh, in previous weeks. Finally, crude oil prices moving a bit higher, although really it didn't help the energy sector, which ended up being the worst performer out of the 11 S&P sectors. You can see on the little preview chart of Bitcoin quite the spike to the upside. This is what a news-driven move kind of looks like. A news headline comes out, and this one particularly talking about Grayscale, which created the uh, GBTC, which is one of the more liquid ways that investors play uh, Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrencies as a whole. On top of that, you have names like Coinbase and others, which are pretty direct plays on uh, the cryptocurrency space. But that GBTC uh, actually winning a suit, uh, Grayscale, to uh, convert or new life into the idea that they can convert that into an actual ETF structure that holds the uh, underlying Bitcoin uh, directly. So we'll see what that actually materializes in, but certainly giving fuel to the bullish case for uh, Bitcoin in terms of broader adapt adaptability and more investors uh, you know, outside of the cryptocurrency mavens uh, having access and actually uh, able to gain exposure to that area of the market. So on that news, Bitcoin up about 6.7% today. Ether price is up over 5% uh, as well. And Bitcoin just narrowly touching 28,000 and dropping just a little bit before we uh, went live here just after 4 p.m. Eastern. Certainly an area of the market showing some renewed signs of strength. Finally, in terms of sectors, Tesla having a decent update today, and that's helping the XLY to the top of the leaderboard, up 2.5% today. So one of the ratios we track is offense versus defense, the XLY versus the XLP being one of the main ways we can do that. And you can see today, certainly the consumer discretionary offense clearly outperforming the defense and consumer staples. That's what this day felt like uh, kind of from the beginning, and you saw that play out through the course of the day. Communication services and technology rounded up the top three performing sectors. These are your FANG stock sectors or the Magnificent Seven sectors uh, kind of doing uh, pretty well and getting it done today. On the bottom, some defensive stuff like utilities and consumer staples, but the worst performing sector, the XLE, the energy sector, is still up, but only uh, about 0.3% from Monday's close. Let's look at a daily chart of the S&P 500, see how today's move sort of fits into this overall trend. And more and more, it's sort of looking like this pullback while breaking below the 50-day moving average really didn't gain a lot of ground to the downside after that. Gave up a little bit more, and you can see that for now, the S&P is sort of uh, set this uh, level around 43.35, 43.40, we'll call it, and now bouncing back higher. What's interesting is uh, last week, just before I left the state here with a, uh, a vacation, you had a bearish engulfing pattern. It did not last long. Uh, this was uh, Thursday's session. Is that right? No, that's Friday's session, opening a little bit lower, but closing a bit higher. Here's Monday sort of chopping around. Today, a nice move to the upside, pushing the S&P back above the 50-day moving average. So 
One of the things that I tend to look at when I'm, when I'm just trying to simply uh, make an assessment, is this thing going up or down? General things I would look at is where is price? Is it making higher highs and higher lows or some other combination? Where is the price relative to key moving averages? And what's the slope of those moving averages? Are they still going up or still go, or, uh, starting to go down? What's interesting is the 200-day moving average, of course, for the S&P 500 continuing to trend higher. That makes sense just given where we're at and the fact that we've had such strength in the second quarter, now into the third quarter, the 200-day moving average is going to continue to slope higher for uh, for a bit just because we're rolling off some pretty low levels and we're adding prices up sort of above the current uh, moving average. That, that upward slope is pretty, pretty set for a little while at least. The 50-day moving average has now tapered off kind of sideways at best, but now closing back above the 50-day sort of makes me think, all right, if that continues to go higher, if we're back above two upward sloping moving averages, this is all of a sudden a market in pretty, uh, in pretty, firm, uh, pretty firm footing. What's interesting is when you look at the momentum characteristics as well, the RSI broke below 40, which for me is kind of one of those red flags that pop up telling me, okay, the momentum is actually a little more weak than I'd like to see. If I'm in sort of a uh, sort of a general bullish uh, bullish mode, what's interesting is it's almost the same reading you have back here in March, and that was after a six-week pullback from the uh, the high or from the peak here in early February to the bottom there in mid-March, where we retested the low from December. That was around 3,800. From there, we kind of rotated back to the upside. For me, though, the real confirmation that this was a a uh, an uptrend that was with renewed strength to the upside, it's when we finally broke to a new swing high. I think getting above 4,200 was that final confirmation that, yep, this is a new uptrend phase with new buyers coming in or certainly new appetite for pushing prices higher. So that tell, that's telling me I need to be patient. And until we get above 4,600, I'm still sort of in a question mark as to whether we put in a lower high or not. Remember, go back to Charles Dow, Dow Theory 101. An uptrend is a pattern of higher highs and higher lows, as long as that continues, the trend is positive. When that stops happening, when we try to make a new high and fail, that's when you can get a little bit, a uh, little bit concerned. So now we kind of have the framework, right? Between around 4350, we'll call it on the lower end, 4300, uh, maybe as an extension of that, 4600 on the up, uh, on the upper end. We actually could chop around in this area for for quite some time, to be honest with you. But what's so interesting is with that as the backdrop, you actually have quite a bit of movement with individual uh, stocks and some groups uh, as well. Uh, today with my guest, Danielle Shea, we're gonna look at some individual names in a little more detail. So I don't wanna go through too many of them, but I just wanna set the stage a little bit more with, uh, with some of the bigger picture observations. Ten-year yield is an important one to watch. We've talked about the interest rate environment. When I see a day like today with growth stocks just pushing to the upside, without looking, I'm going to assume that rates are coming off uh, because it would be highly unlikely, although technically possible, but much less, uh, much less likely that growth stocks like Tesla and Alphabet and Apple would be rallying in the face of rising rates, right? That's just not a complementary behavior, right? Growth stocks moving up to the degree we saw today usually means rates are coming off because that's adding more sort of bullish fuel to the fire, if you will, uh, causing uh, you know upside momentum uh, or giving the opportunity for names like that to have a little bit more upside momentum. It's kind of what we saw here. If you look at the chart of the 10-year, for us, it's dollar sign TNX on the stock charts platform. You can see we rate basically tested the October 22 high that was around 4.3%. We traded just above there about a week ago. And from there, rates have actually come back down about 0.2%, we'll call it. Uh, or sorry, about 0.2% uh, of the way back uh, back down to around 4.12. That's up from around 4.35 we saw at the uh, at the peak. So certainly yields uh, coming down a little bit at the 10-year point across the uh, long end of the curve for, uh, for sure. The bull case for stocks here, particularly for the NASDAQ, I would argue would mean rates most likely have to keep coming down. The 50-day moving average is right around 4%. That was the most recent high in, uh, in early August, or sorry, sorry, most recent low there in early August. That might be a level I'd be watching to see if we hold that uh, or not. But overall, if you're bullish on growthy names here, you want to assume that rates, I think, most likely are, uh, are coming down. For now, they certainly appear to be, uh, appear to be doing so. Semiconductors, let's talk briefly about this. I think, you know, when I think of competing narratives, the, the general observations that I make on a chart like this are the momentum characteristics, number one, and then the, uh, just the trend, right? The absolute trend in the, uh, in the price. What's interesting about this chart of uh, semiconductors, I'm looking at the SMH here. The first thing that jumps off this page, and I look at this chart 
most days, I would say. I haven't looked at it in a couple days because we've been uh, we've been hiking. But as I look at this with fresh eyes today, I'm immediately drawn to this bearish divergence. Now, what could happen? It is very possible that this drawdown we had from around 160 to 145 is it. That was 15 points. That's less than 10%. It's about an 8% pullback. And then we continue higher. That is 100% possible. But again, I would, you know, if you ask me what's the normal behavior after you have a big, clear, bearish divergence like this, I would assume that there's going to be further uh, drawdown than what we've seen so far. What's also interesting, though, I'm going to highlight some of these areas here. And I think this kind of tells the story of uh, where we're at with, uh, with some of these things here. I'm going to shade this guy. Look at this point right here and this point right here and this point right here. What I've done is highlighted these times when the momentum has been very strong, where it's become overbought and then gone down to right around 40. That was this point here in December. That was this point here in late April. And now this is this point here uh, in, uh, in mid-August. The previous two times, of course, this has been basically the higher low before we rotate higher. Look at how consistent semiconductors have been with an initial rally, sort of that impulse move, a consolidation of sorts, a pullback, but then we rotate higher. And that condition where the momentum sort of uh, is not horribly negative, but it's sort of in the lower end, it's sort of right around 3540 has been that viable point. I'm interested in the fact that we've now seen that set up once again. Now, there's no guaranteeing in the investing world that we've seen something two times, so the third time is obviously going to be the same thing. But this is a pattern we've seen not just on this chart, but many other charts over uh, multiple cycles, right? Sort of that buy on the dips mentality, sort of that viable pullback within an uptrend. So I think the stage is set for a nice recovery from here. Again, on something like semiconductors, I'm pretty encouraged if and when we get above the previous high, right? I think the way you negate this bearish divergence is by buyers coming in and pushing prices to new swing highs. This chart could very quickly turn back down. I think for now, I'm sort of torn between these two narratives and I'm waiting to see which way the chart breaks. I'm seeing a lot to be optimistic about given the fact that we've had a similar pullback to what we've seen in uh, previously in the last uh, eight or nine months. Just finally, to finish off our market recap, I wanted to show you the chart of uh, Bitcoin. And again, a bit of a spike back to the upside. Again, this is a news-driven event. We've talked a lot about sort of the general, the way I see the broader competing narratives with something like Bitcoin and really broader cryptocurrencies. This is a decentralized, you know, under-regulated form of exchange, which is a very compelling argument for a lot of investors thinking of the upside potential and that sort of thing. But you also have the challenges with a lack of regulation uh, uh, creates, particularly the fact that a lot of investors will not be able or not be willing to take a shot at something like Bitcoin or have it be a mainstream uh, exchange of uh, a ma ma mainstream uh, form of, uh, of exchange because the fact that it's also unregulated, right? I would say something like a, an ETF, which is actually grounded in actual holdings of Bitcoin, similar to the GLD for gold, could be a huge up, upside, uh, you know, impulse move or could create that sort of move on something like uh, Bitcoin because it gives that impression that more investors will have easier access to make that uh, bet than they've, uh, than they've done so far. Bitcoin moving higher in a big way. From a technical perspective, what's so interesting to me is we essentially tested that June low. That was also a Fibonacci level we talked about, right around 25,000. Bitcoin's oversold right at that point. All of those things, what we call a confluence of support, all lining up around 25,000. And for now, Bitcoin bouncing right off of that level. I'm immediately looking to the left, looking above current levels and seeing overhead resistance still sort of in that 30 to 31,000 level. We uh, need to bring on our guest today, Daniel Shea. Before we do so, a couple quick announcements. First off, we welcome your feedback on our show as always, but we especially welcome your questions. Our mailbag is fueled by people like you sending in the questions you're running into as you are trying to analyze your own charts. Email us at thefinalbar at stockcharts.com on X. Just tag us in a comment at Final Bar SCTV and on our YouTube channel. Of course, just drop a comment below the video that you're watching. We would love to hear from you. We we'll hope to feature your question in our next mailbag segment, which will be on Friday's show of this week. Also, we're doing a really fun thing every Wednesday now at 1 p.m. Eastern, a live q and I'm setting up in our podcast studio just around the corner here. Have a couple charts queued up, and then it's all driven by the questions coming into the uh, chat. It's been a lot of fun. We've had more and more participation every week and a lot of really good questions. Please join us, won't you? That'll be tomorrow, Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Go to our YouTube channel, of course, and you can uh, set a notification so you don't miss when we go live. That'll be tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. 
I'm going to welcome on today's guest, Danielle Shea. Danielle's the Vice President of Options at Simpler Trading, coming to us live from Austin, Texas. Danielle, it's great to see you. How have you been? Okay. I've been doing great, and it's great to see you, too. Thanks for having me back on your show. Good to see you as well. I think we're going to have you in our studio here pretty soon, which is always a pleasure, so I'll look forward to that. But for now, we'll, uh, we'll uh, enjoy your uh, expertise remotely. Talk to us about this overall environment. Today, obviously, a big upswing day. You saw risk assets pushing to the upside, the NASDAQ leading the way higher. When you're looking at the QQQ, do you see things to be encouraged about or things to be more cautious about or both? So, you know, when you look at the cues, I mean, I love the way that the market traded today because you can see a break up above the 50 simple on the daily chart. That is such a critical zone of resistance. And it was really impossible for me to get too excited about the upside with any of the mega caps and especially the cues underneath that level. So, you know, today it was a short covering rally. You know, we had a high put call ratio. We had short covering, um, but What's great about that is when the short covering actually breaks overhead resistance, that means that it can continue. You know, short covering can just be short, sweet, you know, one day wonder. Uh, but in this case, the short covering could actually lead to something better because of those resistance breaks. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. When people describe the reason why the market's going higher as a short covering rally, I don't necessarily mean that, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that's good or bad, but it certainly describes the dynamics of it. We're looking at the chart of the put call ratio, CPC, or dollar sign CPCE on stock charts. You mentioned how the put call ratio has been a little higher. Can you explain what that represents and why you would feel that the rally we're seeing is really driven in, in some way uh, with short covering? So, you know, even if you're not an options trader, I find looking at the put call ratio is really helpful because what it does is it just gives you an understanding of how many people are short versus long in the options market. And so when the put call ratio is up above, you know, 0.85, especially above 0.9, especially above 1.0, what that means is that there is an outsized number of puts that are being held versus calls. And so it's just demonstrating that market participants are very slanted. They're very bearish. And generally what the market likes to do is be an equal opportunity dream killer. And so <laughs> when there's an outsized number of people that are short, you know, if there's a gap up, then you have all of those shorts that have to buy to cover. And so you know, that's something that I find really helpful as far as sentiment is concerned. And especially when you have a high put call ratio, you know, you want to be watching out for any kind of gap up at the open because it doesn't have to be anything major. It just has to be a reason for those short sellers to start losing money and then they have to buy to cover. I love that. An equal opportunity dream killer. That's that's dark, but so accurate, Daniel. I love that. And I should point out on our chart of the put call ratio, I'm doing a five day moving average to try to get, uh, you know, simplify the noise a little bit. But you've certainly seen an elevated put call ratio after being fairly low there June into July. We saw a pretty low reading as uh, as the uh, major averages were pushing higher. Let's talk about some individual names. I mentioned semiconductors in our market recap. NVIDIA was one of the names that uh, you sent to me uh, earlier today. What's the setup here currently in NVIDIA? How are you approaching the stock here? So when you're looking at NVIDIA, you know, we got through earnings. We had pretty much an expected move there. The, a lot of that was priced in and we saw NVIDIA fall post earnings. But what's great about NVIDIA falling after earnings is now that event is over with and we can just continue along with the trend. So I actually really like the way that it's pulled back into the 21 EMA and it consolidated and it's starting to go again. Anytime there's a short covering rally um, or, you know, as you were mentioning earlier, the 10 year starts to fall and you can kind of jump on semiconductors. I love to jump on something that has a really nice trend. And mm -hmm. NVIDIA um, also had a little bit of a squeeze there as well. So I'm actually trading NVIDIA back up into 500. Um, I think it could actually be traded up into 525 as well, but I'm going to use 500 as my first target. And then you know, if we can hit that level and break through it, then I'll continue on into 525. You know, if you see sellers come in there, then I'll forget the 525 and try to get another pullback for up to 500 again. Just depends how it acts. You know, you do have to be cautious with September seasonality. 
but I like this one because I like the overall trend. Um, I think it's a strong stock and it's usually a great one to jump on when there's a short covering rally. It's so interesting. You mentioned uh, earnings last week. This is the earnings day here, the black uh, candle. And obviously, you know, it was it was interesting on that day last week because we kind of gapped higher and traded lower. So, you know, this is a, a stock that has gapped higher, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent on earnings. So at the time, I'm thinking, OK, this is a disaster that NVIDIA isn't going up any more than this. But it really hasn't gone down. Right. I mean, I think that's the, the key. Right. Is the trend has just remained stronger. What would you need to see on a chart like NVIDIA to think, OK, this uptrend phase is now super in question and you need to be playing more on the downside? Is it breaking something like the 21 day EMA or what would you look for here? So generally, I'm looking for moving average crosses. So on the daily chart, you know, anytime you have an 821 or 834 moving average cross, that's a signal. Um, I do not like to see price fall below the moving averages mm -hmm. and especially, you know, down to the 21, down to the 34, those are good buy spots for me. So I'm not too concerned if it breaks the 21 or even the 34. The, the point where I do get concerned is once we break the 50, the 50 mm -hmm. simple, that's a critical line in the sand for me. Um, a break below there, a close below there, and then a subsequent open below the 50 simple. That's really where I see the trend shift. And I say, okay, you know, we got to stop riding this thing to the upside. You're certainly not seeing that yet on NVIDIA. I, I, I think that's fair to say. Let's talk about Microsoft, a little bit of a different phase. I think after looking at NVIDIA sort of all checks all the boxes, uptrend, you know, making, you know, uptrend above those uh, those key moving averages. Microsoft, a little bit more of a question mark. It's pulled back quite a bit and filled. Is there cause for concern here? Do you still see this as an opportunity on the long side? So, you know, Microsoft does have those signals that I was just mentioning. You know, it, it had that moving average cross and it had the break below the 50. But when you look at the lower time frame charts, especially if you look at like a 78, 60 minute chart or a four hour chart, we're starting to see lower time frame squeezes. Mm. And it's also holding up decently well. It's holding on support. And, you know, when we have these short covering rallies, and especially when we have these this movement coming into the NASDAQ, Microsoft is generally one that can rally. And so I'm looking at Microsoft right now, and I think we could trade it up into about 335, where it has quite a bit of resistance. It's only another couple dollars higher. But here's the thing is that if it could get through about 335 in that resistance zone, I think it can resume its uptrend. So mm. I'm following this one really closely. You know, we've seen Tesla especially really start breaking out. Um, it's possible with these short covering rallies, you know, it's always sad when they're short lived. Um, but I always hold out hope that they're going to continue onwards and break through that resistance. But I think at least 335 is a good target. I can't help but notice the MACD indicator also just recently giving a buy signal. You've seen that on some of those names that have pulled back and now potentially bouncing off of support. You mentioned Tesla, Danielle, obviously one of the leading names uh, today. Nice up move up almost 8%. Is this a good time for Tesla? Yes or no? And why? So Tesla's another one that I like to jump on um, on these kinds of days. And, you know, looking at it right here, you can see that it's just directly below that 50 simple, that yellow line right there. And so here's the thing is it could be a terrible time if it doesn't get through that zone, right? But let's say in a perfect world tomorrow, the NASDAQ gaps up, Tesla gaps up above that 50 simple um, that would be a great time to try to get into that and trade it up into 265, 275. So it all depends on how the market gaps overnight and if we can get a break through that zone, because I love trading um, those breaks of those critical resistance zones, because what happens is people have their stops there, right? And so, you know, you get some more short covering at those levels, um, in addition to the short covering in the indexes, and it just mm. can create some really nice moves. With a chart like Tesla, can we just a higher level question, Danielle, how much does the overall environment, this idea that rates are coming down, the idea that the Nasdaq sort of leading the way higher, how much of that plays into your analysis of a chart like Tesla? Or do you think of them as two totally separate things? Here's the big picture environment, but Tesla is doing this based on these checks that I'm making. How do you relate the macro to the micro, I guess? 
So I do always have the overall macro view in mind. I would say that Tesla is a little bit more of a, we call it a honey badger. It's uh, if you go to Google and type in what is a honey badger, you can see this video about the honey badger just doesn't care about what the rest of the market's doing. So Tesla's a little bit of of a stock that can move independent based off of those factors. Hmm. But I do always keep the, those factors in mind as well. So, I mean, I have my overall market view, but at the end of the day, I am primarily a technical based trader, especially when I'm getting in and out. So for hmm. me, if the macro view is a little bit soft and I get my technical setup, I'm still going in. Danielle, we'll have to leave it there. This was awesome. Thanks for sharing some of these charts with us and, and starting with the cues and, and setting up this uh, discussion of a short covering rally. Really interesting. And I appreciate, as always, you sharing your uh, expertise. Be well, stay safe there and awesome. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. That's Danielle Shea. Danielle's the vice president of options at Simpler Trading coming to us from Austin, Texas. I love the markets as an equal opportunity dream killer. I jotted that down as she was saying that. That's a fantastic way of, uh, of saying it. But I think what's interesting is when, if you heard Danielle's way of describing this sort of rally, a short covering rally, and, and you, especially when you have that gap up and you see things move higher, that just means if you're trapped on the wrong side of things, very quickly you have to start you know, changing your tune. Otherwise, you just get crushed big in a, in, a, in a big way. And that sort of covering provides a lot of upside momentum and sort of perpetuates. It's a positive feedback loop. Certainly, we're seeing that with the charts moving higher. I'm intrigued by our comments on Tesla. Now, testing that 50-day moving average from below. Will it get through there? We'll see. Great take there, as always, by Daniel Shea at Simpler Trading. We have to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. Great discussion about Tesla. When I was looking at my chart at Tesla this morning, just seeing that it was having a good open and looking where we're at, I 100% agree with Danielle, immediately focused on the 50-day moving average. I, you know, again, I, I think of the markets and I think of charting in, a, in as simple, simple terms as I can that, that, are, uh, you know, that are consistent and uh, allow me to make disciplined decision. And, and in general, stocks breaking below their 50-day moving average, I'm not a super big fan of. Stock getting back above their 50-day is often a sign that things are starting to improve. I think you saw that with, uh, with Tesla itself as it tested the 50-day a number of times in March and then in April finally broke back down. Getting back above the 50-day, getting through the 200-day sort of sign, you know, signaling that follow through to the upside, which I think is pretty encouraging. We've now broken down through the 50 day. If we can get back above there, this chart is sort of back on my, my checklist. But until then, I'm skeptical. I'm also noticing we became oversold right at that first Fibonacci level. I'm seeing that on a number of different charts. We sort of had that classic pullback using a Fibonacci structure I would normally uh, employ for now holding, which means encouraging. If and when we break below that point, though, that tells you that things are really starting to get worse. For now, Tesla, I think more of a green light than a red light using that sort of framework. Chart number two, Russell 2000. I had one of my own clients uh, ask me about small caps with a little bit of a longer term runway. What's interesting about the small cap space, right? Should small caps be doing better? I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think that's a discussion more about uh, interest rates and the environment and the leadership, which is sort of the mega cap growth trade. That's under uh, weight in the, uh, in the areas uh, in an index like the Russell 2000. It's much more weighted to value oriented sectors, cyclical sectors uh, and, and others. So you're not getting uh, as much upside when growthy things are really, uh, really leading it, particularly the mega cap growth stocks. When I'm looking at the chart of Russell 2000, um, you know, I'm struck by this consistent level of resistance. I think this chart looks really good when the IWM gets above 200. But until then, I'm still seeing this at, at best as a big bottoming pattern, right? And I think that what tells you about what this next leg higher, this broader bull market phase, if and when we declare it, for me, the Russell getting to a new high uh, for the last 12 months, I think could be part of it. Not there yet, although it is testing the 200-day moving average. I saw that. Finally, Charter Communications. I've been struck by uh, some of the media names, entertainment stocks uh, within communication services. Those have been really beaten down. The relative strength on Charter has been absolutely dismal. 
until about six to eight to 10 weeks ago. And then you see that the underperformance turns into a period of outperformance. The momentum starts to improve. The stock becomes overbought and kind of stays there. I've drawn some trend lines just showing a downtrend phase where we're below the trend line support, a consolidation phase where we have a consistent resistance level, what we call a basing pattern, this rectangle pattern. And now we've exited that pattern to the upside. We made a higher low right at the breakout level. This is overall setting up pretty well. So regardless of the macro environment, I'm always thinking that it's a good time to own good charts. I'm seeing in media and some entertainment names, some of those constructive developments that are starting to persist. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Danielle Shea of Simpler Trading joining us from Texas. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.